everyone. This is Bob Souza speaking from historic Main Street, deep in the heart of Somerset Village. Today it is my distinct pleasure to have the Red Sox win their ninth world championship, the ninth World Series in their history, accomplished first in 1903 when they won five of the first 15 World Series played. Actually, now they have won four of their last 15 World Series played for a total of nine, which puts them solidly in third place for most World Series victories. Second place belongs to the St. Louis Cardinals with 11 championships. First place, 27 championships for the New York Yankees. A little footnote has the athletic organization, first in Philadelphia, then in Oakland, also with nine world championships. Five in Philadelphia, four in Oakland. But for the Red Sox, the ninth was certainly historic. A Latin manager for the first time in their history from Puerto Rico, Alex Cora, a utility infielder whom the Red Sox signed to manage the team at age 42 after a successful year winning the world championship as bench coach with the Houston Astros in 2017. He emerges as the top manager in baseball in, 19, in 2018, excuse me. So the Red Sox, with tremendous pitching for the year, starting pitchers, Chris Sale and David Price, left-handed fellas who dominated, especially in the playoffs. And the right-handers, Rich Porcello and Nathan Evaldi, picked up in August. Very dominant against the Yankees. Tight fastball right in on the hands. And Hoyt fans, third punch shot for Nathan. And we had Eduardo Rodriguez. Then the Red Sox used strategic players at every position. They had the best outfield in baseball, both ways as hitters and especially as fielders. Left field, Andrew Benintendi. Center field, Jackie Bradley Jr. Right field, candidate for the Triple Crown, Mookie Bess. And the swingman who was designated hitter and also part-time outfielder, another candidate for the Triple Crown, J.D. Martinez, picked up by the Red Sox from the Diamondbacks, began his career with the Detroit Tigers. Solid hitter throughout. The Red Sox employed three catchers. Blake Swihart, who also filled in at first base and the outfield. Sandy Leon, whose forte was blocking pitches in the dirt especially sliders that were intended to strike out a batter swinging. He blocked them throughout the entire playoffs. And the fellow who emerged catching the most innings, Christian Vasquez, catcher, and also timely hitting. The infield was solid. Mitch Moreland picked up <clears throat> for his hitting, clutch hitting left-handed. Steve Pierce picked up clutch hitting right-handed, ended up most valuable player in the World Series. Home runs galore. Second base, Ian Kinsler picked up from the Texas Rangers by way of the Los Angeles Angels. Actually, Angels first. Angels second, rather, and 
Texas Rangers first, World Series veteran with two losses in 2010 to the Giants, 2011 to the Cardinals when he played for the Texas Rangers. The Brock Holt, who played all the infield positions, played many games at second base. Left-hand hitter, very powerful. Hit for the cycle, and then to show he was a great teammate, sat out the next game. Shortstop, the only man from the other championship of 2013, Xander Bogarts, was a 20-year-old roster player in 2013. Knocked in over 100 runs at shortstop for Alex Cora this year. Third base, two fellas. Eduardo Nunez, a veteran, made timely hits in the playoffs, including a dramatic three-run homer. And, of course, a newcomer, a youngster, 20 years old. Rafael Devers. And Alex Cora to be credited because he used them all in the right situations. They had great respect for his judgment. And I believe that was the primary reason the Red Sox with 108 season wins defeated the Yankees in the division series with 103 wins and the National League series against Houston with 100 wins, also won by Boston. Three games to one over the Yankees, four games to one over the Astros, and four games to one over the Los Angeles Dodgers to win the World Series. And their manager, Dave Roberts, who made some key plays in Red Sox history, especially stealing a base in 04, to start the Yankees on the demise. The Red Sox were down three games to zero, and he ended up with that stolen base, leading the Red Sox back four games to three. So a mighty exciting season for the home team. And as I said before, the ninth win in the history of the franchise. Today's program not only deals with the current situation, the Red Sox triumph in their ninth World Series, but we will look back at the other 12 World Series in which the Red Sox won the first five, lost the next four, four games to three, heartbreaking losses, seven games, and four dramatic series. And of course, Three consecutive wins in 2004, 2007, 2013. So that made the record 8-4 and four going into this season, which is now four out of the last 15 years as the 2018 Red Sox triumphed over the Los Angeles Dodgers. Hello everyone, this is Bob Souza speaking from historic Main Street in Somerset Village, deep in the heart of our studio at SATV9. My guest today, return appearance, Bill O'Neill, loyal Red Sox fan for 80 years, Bill. Thank you, and it's a little better program we have today than the previous two were kind of downtrodden. Right. We got some successes in this era. And we're very happy to be able to show the folks. Uh, years ago, the Red Sox were the most dominant team in World Series history. The first 15 years of the World Series, uh, the Red Sox were victorious five times. They had a 5-0 and record. And it all started in 1903 because of the owner of the Pittsburgh Pirates, Barney Dreyfus, proposed that his National League champion Pirates play the American League winner, the Boston Pilgrims slash Americans, today of course our beloved Red Sox. Cy Young, the immortal Cy Young with 511 victories, was one of the star pitchers for Boston 
in the World Series of 1903. We get a look at Cy warming up in the pregame at the Huntington Avenue grounds, the early home of the Red Sox from 1901 to 1911. Huntington Avenue grounds today, the home of Northeastern University. I was fortunate to play in this World Series ballpark four years for Providence College, 1958 through 61. So brings back fond memories. About 11,000 uh, fans attended each of those World Series games, most of whom standing. Another look at the 03 slide will show us uh, Bill Deneen, Red Sox pitcher who won three games. Cy Young won two. It was the best of nine. The Red Sox won five games. The Pirates won three. Bill Deneen won three games for Boston. And Deacon Philippe, the Pittsburgh Pirate pitcher, won three games in a losing effort. So that was history in the making, 1903, the original World Series. Bill, we see Bill Deneen in the bottom right segment of the slide and a look at the Huntington Avenue grounds behind and we can see most of the crowd standing room only. Quite a bit different from Fenway. Yeah, that is uh, quite a bit different. But the one thing I noticed in the previous uh, picture was in the 100 years since they started, the uniforms have not changed all that much. It's still a basic baseball uniform. Little, little of the accessories have changed, but uh, they're I think very similar to what we currently uh, The players see. wore them a little differently then, and knee-high knickers would have been the state-of-the-art type wearing of the uniform. Today, some wear uh, the knee-high britches, britches, and others, of course, down to the pant level, like uh, be wearing regular pants. All right, we have Larry Gardner in this picture. Uh, this is 1912. The Red Sox beat the Giants, New York Giants, four games to three with one tie because of darkness. Gardner hit the fly ball, which brought in the winning run. The Red Sox winning four and the uh, New York Giants three. That was uh, 1912. That's Fenway Park in the background. Also, the next slide, we look at uh, Christy Matheson, great pitch, pitcher for the New York Giants of John McGraw, 373 victories lifetime, one of the all-time great pitchers and great uh, World War I hero, uh, inhaled gas in the German unleashing of gas warfare in World War I prematurely died in 1925 when he was uh, owner and general manager of the Boston Braves. Well, now we've gone up to what? Up to World War I, I guess, uh, or just post-World War I. Well, we're heading for World War I. This is Smokey Joe Wood for the Red Sox, Bill. He won 34 games in 1912. He and Hugh Bedient were the top pitchers for the Red Sox beating John McGraw's Giants during that particular 1912 World Series, the first at Fenway. Now we'll be heading to, uh, let's see, 1915, the Red Sox will be playing the Philadelphia Phillies. This is the great outfield of Harry Hooper, Tris Speaker, and Duffy Lewis. And, uh, was that uh, Duff, the Duffy Lewis who the cliff was named after? Right, in left field. Okay. You would yeah. probably seen that in younger days. Well, not really. They had the, 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 the basic, uh, not the modern uh, green monster, but the uh, the original one. Right. With the whole, filled totally with uh, commercials and advertisements. For, right, and the cliff had been removed. Duffy's cliff had been left. Had been removed, Okay. Yeah. These are the Red Sox pitchers as they get ready for the Brooklyn Dodgers, the 1916 World Series. Uh, let's see, which, no, I'm, I'm sorry, this is still 1915. Uh, interesting, this is the Red Sox infield. 
And the fella, uh, third from the left, second from the right, is a person I ran across, Jack Barry, coach of Holy Cross College for over 40 years in baseball. Following his career with the Red Sox, he became the Holy Cross baseball coach and 40 plus years there. He was also a member of Connie Mack's Philadelphia Athletic World Champions of 19, uh, let's see, 10, 19, 11, and 1913. Interesting that you mentioned that, uh, just a, a tidbit. The first home run that Ted Williams ever hit in New England was hit at Holy Cross. At Fitton Field. At Fitton Field, they used to play an exhibition game just prior to the season, uh, returning from Florida or wherever they were conducting their spring training. And Over 400 feet, Bill, long distance from home plate oh, was a to the right field stands. Long Fitton way uh, out to uh, right field at Holy Cross, yeah. Now these are the uh, ace pitchers of the Red Sox in 1916 as they prepare for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Babe Ruth is hiding in there? Babe Ruth, who uh, had quite a few shutout innings recorded, and he set the World Series record for consecutive shutout innings as a pitcher, 29 and two-thirds. It lasted till 1961 when Whitey Ford broke the record. Whitey had 32 consecutive scoreless innings. Babe Ruth also lost his home run record when Roger Maris hit 61 to break the Babe's 20, uh, 1927 record of uh, 60. Also, uh, Carl Mays in the picture of right-handed Dutch Leonard, the left-handed to Ruth's left. Quite a pitching staff. So they had no trouble with the Dodgers in the five-game series of 1916. The next one would be, I believe, uh, 1918, and this is uh, another pitching dominant World Series. This was against the Chicago Cubs, and during World War I, which broke out in 1914, the United States officially involved in 1918, the last year of the war, cut its season short. The season had to end by Labor Day, and the World Series had to be quickly played. First three games were played in Comiskey Park as opposed to Wrigley Field because the Cubs wanted the 15,000 more seating capacity. Then, of course, the next three games uh, were played in Fenway Park. The Red Sox uh, defeated the Chicago Cubs in six games. That was the last time the Red Sox had clinched the World Series at home. 1918. The previous two World Series, Bill, the home team, a home Red Sox field was Braves field because it sat 12,000 more people than Fenway. So they beat the Phillies at Braves field in 1915 and the uh, Dodgers at Braves field in 1916. So they juggled around some of the ballparks for the sake of seating capacity. And let's see if we have anything else going back to 1918. Uh, from 1918, there was a long dry period before they ever played a, another World Series game. Exactly. We uh -huh. see Babe Ruth setting the record. He gets up to 29 and two-thirds scoreless innings. This is the 1918 World Series. He was a part-time outfielder this year. I think he hit 29 home runs as a part-time outfielder and pitcher, breaking the old major league record of Ned Williamson's 27. Following this, he'll be an outfielder only in 1919 with Boston. Then in January of 1920, he'll be sold to the New York Yankees for $135,000. And of course, 28 years, uh, they would... Uh, go up to, let's see, they would not be in a World Series until 28 years. This was a star pitcher, right-handed pitcher in 1918, Carl Mays. He was also sold to the New York Yankees. Submarine pitcher, very difficult to hit. And uh, uh, he was the person who killed uh, Ray Chapman of the Cleveland Indians in 1920 
playing in the dead ball era with a darkened baseball that had been used for nine innings, couldn't be seen too well. Yankees' home field was the polo grounds, and uh, Mays' submarine pitch hit Chapman the side of the head, fractured his skull, and he died the next morning in the New York hospital. So that was the end, 1918. Now we go to the four World Series bill in which heartbreak occurred. Seven game series, 46, 67, 75, and 86. Tragic losses, heartbreaking losses, but a great interest in baseball. This is 1946. Johnny Pesky is the uh, Red Sox infielder who was sliding into second base. Cardinal rookie second baseman Red Shandings is being upended by Pesky in this uh, early uh, game of the 1946 World Series. And Bill, you will remember this one. Oh, that's, uh, that's Enos Slaughter. And that was the, uh, I guess, the winning run in the series. That was the winning and, run, and was kind of game a seven. Yep, and it was kind of a fluke in that uh, no one anticipated uh, Enos trying to score. I think he was on first base. First base. The Harry Pat was hit Walker in was front of the center fielder, and he just kept running. It was always said that uh, Pesky hesitated on making the relay throw, but it, it later it was really disproved that it was just a... a, a gap in the heads-up play by the Red Sox at, uh, and the gamble by uh, Enos Slaughter that gave them the World Series. And well, what had happened, the uh, Cardinals were leading 3-1, to one, Red Sox batting in the eighth inning. The only fellow who really murdered the ball that particular game was Dominic DiMaggio. With two men on, he hit a double, scoring the tying runs tying up the game, but Dominic pulled a hamstring muscle going into second base, and they had to be replaced. And Slaughter knew whoever replaced Dominic would not have a strong arm. So Johnny Pesky, the shortstop, had to go deeper for the relay throw, and uh, as a result, he was disoriented somewhat and couldn't hear Bobby Doerr yelling, home, home, home. Slaughter never stopped, rounded third base right through the signs of Mike Gonzalez, the hold-up sign, scored and made that famous slide. That picture appeared in every newspaper in the country. Heartbreaking loss in seven games to the St. Louis Cardinals. Now we go to 1967. And now we're getting at something we know about. Right, right you are Not like, reading about. <laughs> right, I listened at the 46 series, I listened on the radio, I was eight years old, telegraphic recreation. The star was a little left-hand pitcher, Harry Burkeen, the first left-hander to win three games in a World Series. Now we have 1967, a right-handed Cardinal pitcher who wins three games. The Hall of Fame uh, slants of Bob Gibson here are on screen, and he was tough. Mean, tough pitcher. Just another... Uh Another tidbit in this period was uh, basically pre-television. But the Herald News, and they, they were located where they are located now, on I guess it's Pocasset Street. Pocasset River, Street, yes. Used to provide a running scoreboard. They had a teletype into the game, running scoreboard, and would post the pitch-by-pitch pitch accounting of the game. And the, the, the crowds would be spread out all along Picasso Street, waiting for that feedback from wherever they were playing, you know. Uh, well, my, very interesting. Uh, my uh, teammate from American Legion Baseball, great hero in Fall River, Russ Gibson, caught the first game of that World Series. Caught Jose Santiago, pitched a great game, losing to Gibson 2-1. Uh, to one. Here we have Boston hero, 22-game winner during the regular season, Jim Lonborg. Jim won the two games, won two games in that Red Sox uh, series. I'm going to just check. I know he won, uh, let's see. 
game two, five to nothing, and game six, he won three to one. The uh, second game, he gave up just one hit, and the uh, fifth game, he gave up two hits. So he had only given up three hits in his uh, two victories. But Bob Gibson was so dominant, Gibson won his games, uh, the opener two to one, and then uh, six to nothing, game uh, five, and then game seven, seven to two. He pitched on three days rest. Poor Jim Lonborg was called upon with only two days rest to pitch in that uh, particular game. Yeah, and not only that, uh, Jim Lonborg had pitched on the closing day of the season to clinch the American League title for the Red Sox. And you were there, Bill. And I was there. Minnesota was, Twins. Minnesota Twins. There's a picture of... Uh, uh, that's, uh, that's Yastrzemski, I believe. No, that's looks that's like, Yastrzemski. That's Yastrzemski. Right. Uh, he won the Triple Crown that yeah. year. Eddie Popowski, number 32, the third base coach, is shaking hands. Yeah. 44 home runs tied Harmon Killebrew, 126 RBIs, and a 326 batting average. He led the league in those three categories. The interesting thing about Yastrzemski in that last game is that he not only had a key hit, you know, to put the Red Sox ahead. But he made a tremendous play in left field. I think the Red Sox were probably up two runs. And I don't know if it was uh, Allison or Killebrew who hit one off the left field wall down in the corner that looked like a sure double, which meant that uh, Minnesota would be within one run and guy on second base, and he threw the guy out trying to stretch it into a double. Amazing. Uh, yeah, great, great uh, fielder. Yep. Oh, yeah. Great arm, yep. and uh, he was uh, MVP in 1967. I'm just going to read a few guys on the Impossible Dream Team, 67. The year before, they finished ninth place, a half game ahead of the 10th place Yankees in 1966. They hired Dick Williams from the AAA Toronto Maple Leaf team, which was a Red Sox number one uh, team that year, farm team. And Dick Williams brought Russ Gibson, Fall River's own, who would, was in his 10th year of minor league baseball. And he said, why don't you come up? And he said, uh, be with me, you can be a coach for me. So Russ said, okay. So they went to spring training. Sure enough, Russ, Russ did some coaching in the bullpen, but Dick Williams thought he was a great receiver, put him on the playing roster, and he ended up catching game one of the World Series. Some of the guys, Bill, I'd like to read to you. Yeah, remember. go ahead. George Scott, first base. Mike Andrews and Jerry Adair, second base. Joe Foy, third base. Rico Petroselli, shortstop. Carl Yastrzemski in left. Reggie Smith in center. Jose Tartabull in right. The catchers, Russ Gibson, and of course, a deal they pulled in August, which broke the hearts of Fall River fans. They purchased Elston Howard from the Yankees. Howard caught the other six games in the uh, World Series. The Cardinals, behind Russ, uh, behind Bob Gibson, had a powerful lineup. Cepeda, Orlando Cepeda, Julian Javier, Mike Shannon, Del Maxville in the infield. The great outfield, Lou Brock, Kurt Flood, and Roger Maris who was sold by the Yankees to the Cardinals. And the great Hall of Fame announcer, Tim McCarver, was the Cardinal catcher in 1967. But it was Bob Gibson who dominated that World Series, picked up three wins, just as Harry Burkeen had picked up three in 1946. So amen, the Cardinals have won again in seven games. We now head to 1975, another heartbreaking year for the Red Sox. The manager this year is uh, Darrell Johnson, and he goes against Hall of Fame Cincinnati manager uh, Sparky Anderson. In this picture, we get a look at three Hall of Famers from Cincinnati. The great Johnny Bench, catcher number five. In the middle, first baseman uh, Tony Perez from Cuba number 24, 
and Joe Morgan, diminutive second baseman and Hall of Famer number eight for the uh, Cardinals. Comments on those fellas, Bill? You've seen them many times on Oh, yeah, television. yeah, they were quite, because Bench, uh, Johnny Bench was probably the best catcher that we have ever seen, really. I mean, a combination of both defensively and offensively. Uh, uh, Perez came to the Red Sox later, right? At the end Late of his summer, career, at the right. End of his First base career, designated and, uh, hitter. I'm sure anyone who's been watching the Major League Baseball in the last 20 or 30 years knows Joe Morgan because he was a, an announcer on that uh, program for Sunday for Night years. Baseball. Sunday Night Baseball. Sure. Yeah. ESPN. They had quite a team. Quite right. a team. That was the big it, red. It was a uh, big red machine. And that was the the year that uh, uh, Carlton Fisk tied the game with a. Uh, the one thing, uh, uh, Bernie Carbo. Carbo tied the game three with home, a three, three run homer. Three run homer. Yep. And then I, Fisk won it with a we, home run off the. Uh, we have Bernie here. We have to make an ball. adjustment on the screen. This is Bernie batting, uh, pinch hitting in the ninth inning with the Red Sox trailing, and uh, he had a pinch hit three run homer. And the pitch hit it could be, was it Chiraldi? No, that was, uh, Chiraldi was with the. Met series in okay, uh, uh, in uh, eighty. Who did they bring up a Pawtucket that uh, gave up the winning hit? In which game, Bill? This would have been the uh, the last game, the uh, okay seventh yeah. game, and it wasn't that good a hit. Uh, he really got the guy uh, off Jim, balance swinging, and he just had a little loop over second base. Jim Willoughby, I think it was. Might have been Willoughby. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what happened? Uh, there's uh, Bernie Cabo's pinch three-run homer here in the ninth yep. inning. And uh, this set the stage for, the yeah, let's see, the pinch, the home run by Carlton Fisk should be coming up in the 12th inning, bottom of the 12th. And Pete Rose had mentioned this was the greatest game ever played. So this is a 7-6 to six Boston victory. And Harris Carlton Fist signaling. He's pushing it inside the, fair, the fair pole, territory, right? right? Right. You think that worked? It worked, Bill. <laughs> it worked inside the pole for the dramatic yep. home run. Now, this is game six. It forces a game seven. Incredibly, the Red Sox behind Bill Lee. Led three nothing for five innings, and the uh, Reds couldn't get the ball out of the infield, even though he was lobbing them in there. Semi blooper pitching, Ethers pitching, and then it all came apart in the fifth inning when Tony Perez slammed one into the screen, tied the game three three, and Joe Morgan off balance got that single. Yeah. to beat them 4-3, to three, which was the final score. Another heartbreaking loss. I'll read some of the names of the Red Sox in uh, 75. First base, Cecil Cooper. Second base, Denny Doyle. Third base, Rico Petroselli, who would move from short to third from the other World Series. Yastrzemski, Carl Yastrzemski in left. Freddie Lynn, Rookie of the Year, center field. And... Uh, Let's see, Dwight Evans, great defensive outfielder, was in right. Uh, injured was Jim Rice. He wasn't able to play. So Yastrzemski, who went from first base to left field in that series. Carlton Fisk was the great catcher. The star pitchers for Boston, Louis Tiant, who won two games. Rick Wise, then of course the tragedy with Bill Lee. The Reds had Tony Perez, Joe Morgan, Pete Rose, Dave Concepcion in the infield, George Foster in left, C.J. Geronimo in center, Ken Griffey Sr. in right, Johnny Bench behind the plate. Uh, the pitching was mainly a bullpen-oriented pitching as Captain Hook, uh, Sparky Anderson made rapid changes. Don Gullett, Pat Darcy, Gary Nolan were the guys who pitched most of the time. So that was a heartbreaker. 
That concluded 1975. Several years later, Darrell Johnson was fired, replaced by Don Zimmer. Red Sox blew the 77 season at a 13-game lead in August. They blew that to the Yankees. In 78, they had the playoff game at Fenway Red Sox, and uh, uh, Yankees tied for first, and Bucky Dent hit the home run off uh, Mike Torres to beat Boston 4-3 to three in that uh, series. Now we head in New that, York. Yes, please. In that game, uh, Paul Rivers' own, or Somerset's own, Jerry Remy, uh, almost had the game-winning hit. And uh, Lou Pinella made a tremendous play, and uh, it ended up being a single to right field. Had it go by Pinella, a couple of runs would have scored, and the Sox would have probably clinched the game. Exactly. That but, was uh, the sun was so tough out there. Pinella made a stab, blind stab, and the ball bounced yep. in the glove. Amazing. Yeah. And Remy always dis uh, discussed that situation with Pinella whenever. They were brought, he was broadcasting and Pinella was managing or coaching and uh, how Pinella really won the World what got the Yankees into the World Series. Uh, let's see, that was uh, the playoff of 78. That was 78, the, the playoff. The yeah. Yankees had won the World Series in 77 over the Dodgers. 78, they went on to beat the Dodgers. Uh, in 76, getting back to the big red machine, they murdered the Yankees in four straight after, you know, beating the Red Sox in seven games in well, they had a very, 75. Very, very uh, powerful team. All right, here we go, Bill. New York, New York. Uh, most hated team, the New York Mets. They had a bunch of characters who were angry guys, but they were staring defeat right in the face and came back to win that series Hot break again for the Red Sox, seven games, and the Mets won in seven games. But the first two games at Shea Stadium, behind Bruce Hurst, Hurst and Roger Clemens at Shea Stadium, Boston wins 1-0 and 9-3. Now they're going to come to Fenway Park for games 3, 4, and 5, and the Red Sox probably figure They've got a great shot to win. But the Mets win in Fenway 7-1, to 6-2. to two. But there is hope. Bruce Hurst again wins 4-2, to two, game 5. So the Red Sox lead three games to two. The scene is now Shea Stadium, game 6 and 7. The Red Sox just have to win one to clinch the World Series of 1986. Your thoughts, Bill, as we go. Well, my thoughts there, six. because everyone uh, remembers uh, uh, Billy Buckner's error on a ground ball that would have ended the game, I guess. That would have been game six, heartbreaker. Ga game six, and the uh, Sox would have went home with the title. We what see. they don't remember is that I think it was a batter before or two batters before that they also blew a chance to get the third out when there was either a pass ball or a wild pitch, kind of controversial as to, you know, what the, who got the error, but uh, it was Rich Gedman who was catching. And I think he was uh, assigned a, a pass ball. So. Right. Worcester native Rich Gedman assigned a pass yes. ball for uh, Bob Stanley. Stanley, yeah. Yeah, he broke off the mound very late, which uh, allowed the run to score. And... Uh, they were really discombobulated. In this picture, we have Lenny Dykstra, the Met center fielder, uh, scoring on a, this might have been the pass ball. That's third base coach uh, Harrelson, Bud Harrelson. Probably the pass ball. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what happened. And uh, for the Red Sox, Bill Buckner at first, Marty Barrett at second, Wade Boggs, line drive hitter par excellence, third base, Spike Owen at short, Jim Rice in left, Dave Henderson in center, Dwight Evans again, the right fielder. This is Jim Rice scoring uh, the, the go-ahead run in, uh, this is in New York, this is game six. 
That's Gary Carter, Mets catcher Hall of Fame, trying to make a play, but it's too late as uh, Jim Rice is in there. Uh, well, again, heartbreaking for the Red Sox. There's always some fluke, and it's been 80 years now at this point uh, right. since we won a uh, World Series. Right, going back to 1918. Right. This is Buckner holding on. Mookie Wilson, number one. Mookie hit about four, four or five consecutive foul balls when they were uh, trying to strike him out, and then he hit that ground ball through Buckner's legs, which scored Ray Knight with the winning run and a 6-5 to five, uh, Mets victory. Would then, you... of course, in the seventh game, Bill, the Red Sox again with a 3 nothing lead will end up losing 8-5 to five, tragically. This is the fella who couldn't hold the lead, Calvin Schiraldi. Schiraldi. Yeah, yeah, but he pitched great. I think maybe uh, he stayed, uh, John McNamara stayed too long. The other mistake that McNamara made was not putting in Dave Stapleton to replace Bill Buckner as he had done the last uh, month of the season. Buckner's knees were bad. Yeah, Buckner was hurting. Right. He was hurting. Couldn't bend his knees yeah. too well. Even when he hit good line drives, he ran stiff-legged. But uh, defensive replacement Stapleton was very good. He chose to manage with, with his emotions rather than his heart. Uh, rather his heart rather than his head, keeping Buckner in there, and the ground ball went through his legs. But again, the Red Sox uh, had the opportunity. I'll quickly read the Mets lineup in 86. The infield, Keith Hernandez, Wally Backman, Ray Knight, Rafael Santana. The outfield, Mookie Wilson, Lenny Dykstra, Darryl Strawberry. Catcher, Hall of Famer, Gary Carter. Pitchers, Ron Darling, Bob Oeda, Dwight Gooden, Sid Fernandes. So that is the fourth loss in seven games. So the Red Sox World Series record is now five wins, four losses. As we come to the modern era, and this is 2004, a new and manager. We have Pedro. Pedro Martinez, a new manager in uh, Tito Francona, and we have Pedro Martinez, who will be the savior of Red Sox pitching. A lot of heartbreak for him uh, several years before that, in 03, 02, 01 with Boston, but uh, nevertheless, 04, great year for him. So this is the beginning of the triumph. The Red Sox win four straight. The first two are at home, 11-9, behind Wakefield, 6-2 to two behind uh, Pedro. There's a guy that's been in the headlines lately. And we see, <laughs> going back to the regular season, a brawl here between Alex Rodriguez and Jason Veritek in August of uh, 2004. Your comments, Bill, on that scene. Well, I, they, they claim that, by the way, was not in the World Series. That was uh, in August. prior to it. Yeah, it... Uh, most people uh, uh, indicate that that was the turning point for the Red Sox season. From there, they played better ball. They went on, uh, got into the playoffs, went down, what, three games to zip? Three to zip. And came back with, uh, uh, and won uh, four games and knocked the Yankees out. Uh, at that time, a Mo Vaughan, not Mo Vaughan, uh, David Ortiz, David Ortiz right. really uh, came into his own. Powerful and, hitter. And when they got into the World Series, they didn't leave any chance to make a fluke play, destroy them, and lose the series for them. Oh, they demolished, they, the the yeah, yeah, they demolished the Cardinal. Here's Off Tito the Francona. Yep. And his pitching staff was immense. Uh, let's see. He usually, uh, as I said, the first game, 11 9 in Boston behind uh, Tim Wakefield, then 6-2 to two behind Pedro, then out to St. Louis, and the victory for, uh, uh, let's see here, oh, Kurt Schilling with the, with the sock, the bloody sock, in a 4-1 uh, to one win. And then the clincher, 
Derek Lowe, three to nothing yeah. win over the Cardinals, so four straight. Uh, Doug, Doug Mankiewicz and Kevin Millar at first, Mark Bellhorn at second, Bill Miller at third, Orlando Cabrera at short, picked up in a trade in which they were, they sent uh, uh, Nomar Gashapara to the Cubs. Okay, uh, let's see, the outfield, Manny Ramirez in left, Johnny Damon in center, Trot Nixon in right. You Jason, skipped the third baseman. Third you? baseman, Bill Miller. Bill Miller. Yep. Bill Miller, won, was that the year he won the batting title? Uh, yes. Very low number, but he was... Uh, right. He was consistent. Yep. Uh, let's see. David Ortiz, designated hitter. And, of course, the pitching was superb. Starting pitching from uh, Pedro, Kurt Schilling, and Derek Lowe. And the relief pitcher who was great was Keith Folk, saved the final game. That was quite a series. The Cardinals had the great Albert Pujols, and they thought Pujols would lead the Cardinals to victory. But they had trouble fielding bunts. They were picked off base. Very sloppy uh, team coached or managed by Tony La Russa. It was actually sad to watch a team that was great all season long in the National League led from start to finish, play so poorly yeah, in 0-4. As, as I remember, the weakest defensive players were the pitchers. Exactly. Couldn't they, field bunts. Couldn't field bunts. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. This is Manny Ramirez taking a powerful swing at Fenway, uh, hitting one over the monster. And uh, prior to that was Big Poppy when uh, he tattooed the wall and left hitting the outside pitch and could also pull the ball into the bullpens and right field for home runs. He was a terrific player and of course Manny had those great years before he started to fail his drug test and uh, suspended by Major League Baseball. At least it came after the 07. Here is Keith Folk picking up the ground ball to end the game, throwing to Mankiewicz, getting hugged by uh, Veritek as the Red Sox for, what was it, 86 years, Bill, without a World Series triumph. Finally get that triumph, 2004, four consecutive games. They are now, World Series-wise, six wins, four losses. And of course, more good things will happen three years later as we get ready for the World Series of 2007. Here's Kurt Schilling who was very instrumental in that World Series of 04. We'll see his pitching with the bloody sock here with a torn tendon, which uh, had to be majestically stitched so that the bleeding would be held to a minimum. And, and again, the, the road to the World Series went through the New York Yankees. Again. Again. Right. The, the curse of the Bambino had the Red Sox struggling against the Yankees until this year, the 86-year curse. So well, that, it was good getting some... Uh, here's the banner. Uh, opening day 2005, the Yankees come to Fenway, and the big banner, 2004 World Series champions. But this particular year did not belong to the Red Sox. This 05 season, the Chicago White Sox triumphed uh, and they beat the Houston Astros in the World Series five straight games. 06, the Cardinals return and uh, beat the Detroit Tigers by a, a, in a five-game series, four games to one. But here we go, 07. We're back, Bill. The Red Sox and the Colorado Rockies. The Rockies got to the World Series by winning 21 out of 22 games at the end of the season, 11 in a row. They were so happy getting into that World Series that it was such a, an emotional letdown that they really were no factor in the four games against the Red Sox. This is Tori Elba, the catcher, who was thrown out at first base by, uh, I think it's Mike Lowell throwing it third over to first baseman Kevin Euclid, who was in his first year. 
Mike Lowell, by the way, ended up the MVP of uh, right. that Wilson. Originally a throw-in deal, a throw-in in the Josh Beckett deal. Right. And uh, he played a terrific season for Boston. Uh, 300 hit up, very good in the clutch. And this was the savior of the bullpen. Very, very youthful Jonathan Papelbon. The Red Sox also got great work from starting pitcher John Lester. Uh, Josh Beckett, of course, Daisuke Matsuzaka, Kurt Schilling, Clay Buckholz, and a great closing by Papelbon. Uh, when you step back, they had a a real strong pitching staff. Well, that year, yeah, of course, know, Colorado he, was over, overwhelmed. Yeah, that's true. Euclid at first, Pedroia, Dustin Pedroia at second, Mike Lowell at third, Julio Lugo at short. And we get a look at the center fielder here, Jacoby Ellsbury, who was brought up mid-season when the regular center fielder, Coco Crisp, got hurt. Manny Ramirez played left, J.D. Drew played right, so they were solid everywhere in 07. Jason Veritek, again the catcher. The Rockies had mostly Todd Hilton at first, and Matt Halliday in left. They were just no competition for Did they Boston. have the, uh, the shortstop then? Uh, yeah, Troy Tolowitzki yeah. was a young... I didn't want to challenge you with no, no. that. No, no, Troy was there. I have the entire <laughs> but, uh, lineup. Yeah, no, no, he, But uh, they were no factor. I wasn't really sure what he was with yeah. the team that, uh, yeah, you're at right. that time. But, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Jeff Francis... He turned out to be a very good player. Jeff Francis was a pitcher. Obaldo Jimenez, Josh Fogg, Adrian Cook. I mean, nobody heard of the last and the big two. guy was a manager. Clint Hurdle, Clint Hurdle, manager of the year. And yeah. again, this year with the lowly Pittsburgh Pirates, he got them in the playoffs. And they were defeated by, uh, I believe, the Cardinals, who are going to battle the Red Sox again in the World Series 2013. Before the Red Sox got to this World Series, they had to defeat the Detroit Tigers for the championship of the American League. And this is a great pickup in the offseason. Shane Victorino coming in to hit a grand slammer to beat Detroit at Fenway Park. Detroit was a favorite team to win because of their pitching. Uh, Justin Verland, of course, was great. Max Serja, another great pitcher. But the Red Sox battled and won this series from the Tigers because of uh, great work from the Bearded Ones. That is, uh, uh, let's see, this is uh, David Ortiz. David. Oh, fantastic again. Uh, some of the other Red Sox at first base, Mike Napoli, Dustin Pedroia, again a World Series champion at second, Will Middlebrooks at third, Stephen Drew, brother of J.D., shortstop, Johnny Gomes, uh, Daniel Nava in left, Jacoby Ellsbury in center, Shane Victorino in right, Jared Saltalamacchia, and David Ross catching David Ortiz, the designated hitter. In this series, we have the uh, bases clearing double to win the series in game six by Shane Victorino again. The Red Sox won the first one at Fenway, 8-1. to one. The Cardinals, the second one, 4-2. to two. Then they went to St. Louis, the infamous obstruction play. The Cardinals won 5-4. to four. But then the Red Sox came back to win games 4, 5, and 6. 4 and 5 in St. Louis, 4-2 to two and 3-1 to one behind uh, Lackey, Buckholz, Jake Peavy, and the final game in Boston, game six, six to one. And that was saved here by Koji Uehara, who hey. was the most valuable player in he, the World Series. Uehara, amazing. He came out of nowhere. He did. For the last half of the year, right? He was great I think all his season. his average was about uh, 0.05. Great all uh, season, yeah. Bill. And... Uh, and 2013, that was the triumph number uh, eight for the Red Sox in World Series play. Eight wins, 
four losses in their 12 series. Relief pitching was so important. Uh, Papelbon in 07, and of course, uh, Keith Folk in 04. So when you go to Yorkie Way, Bill, take a look at the banners outside the ballpark. You will see eight red banners for World Series championships, four blue banners for losses in 46, 60, 67, 75, and uh, 86 to the Mets. There is also one other blue banner, and that belongs in the year, two th uh, nine, let me see, two th uh, 1904. I'm, uh, get my years confused here. You know what I would suggest? We, we, we cut it off at this highlight here. We couldn't have better years than we've had with the Red Sox right. in and the last decade. That's for sure. In 04, Bill, John McGraw refused to play the American League champion Red Sox because he thought the American League was inferior. But the money that could be made in World Series play uh, caused the Giants to get back in the World Series in 05 when they defeated Connie Mack's Athletics. So for Bill O'Neill and myself, this is Bob Souza saying, thanks for being with us. We'll be rounding third and heading home. Thanks, Bill. Good to have you again. You're welcome. Thank you.